Hi, my name is James. I'm one of the intensive care doctors here at Chelsea and Westminster. I'm going to take you through how we insert a central line. So for the purposes of this video, I'm not going to be wearing a mask and a hat. It just keeps things a little bit easier for filming, but you definitely should. At this point, you can imagine that I've already scrubbed, I've got my mask and hat on, and I've completed the first stage of the lock zip. Next thing, we're going to clean. I've set up the patient with a slight head down, which if they can tolerate it, will make your life a lot easier for internal jugular lines. There's an inco pad underneath their shoulder, and now I'm going to start cleaning. Just flicking this does help it come to the end. Cleaned and I'm going to dispose of this carefully off to the side and then apply the sterile drape. I like to open these out just to make placement that little bit easier. And I'm going to clean again and allow that to air dry. Make sure that the site is as clean as possible as this should be a sterile technique. I'm now going to prep my line using the spike and a bag of sterile saline. I'm going to draw up some saline, flush the line to make sure it's free of any air. For the non-distal ports, which in our ones is anything but the green one, make sure you apply the clip after you've flushed it. Now that my line is flushed and ready, I'm going to pick up my ultrasound probe. Inside the pack, there's some ultrasound jelly, the drape itself, some rubber bands and some tape. To use the drape most effectively, what I find is best is to part it at the closed end, opening each layer in turn until you get to the center. Put your hand through to make sure you're in the right place and then grab it with your other hand. You can then push this back through to let you pick up the probe and also put a small amount of jelly at the end of the probe cover bag. If you've got an assistant, you can then ask them to pass you the probe cover. However, a little tip if you don't is to use the sterile field that the probe cover came in to pick up your probe and pass it to yourself. This can then be discarded and the probe cover pushed over the probe, meaning that you stay sterile the entire time. One rubber band over the end and make sure that the air is out. You can attach additional rubber bands or tape if you need to, but generally I find I don't need it. Final step, the rest of the ultrasound jelly I put at the top of my sterile field. This way, I then don't have to reach across to get it, and when this is messy, I'm not going to get it on any other part. A quick tip to figure out which end of the ultrasound is the correct end and whether you should be holding it one way or the other, rather than pressing on the end, which you can do, but you end up with jelly on your finger, is to dip one corner in and have a look at your screen. I know that this is the right way around, so the left-hand side with the buttons facing out will correspond to the left-hand side of the screen. And if you need any more ultrasound jelly, it's easy to just dip it in the puddle. Before I start, I want to get the best possible ultrasound picture using a combination of position, tilt, and rotation, and then map out where the vein travels so that as I move my probe forwards and backwards towards the chest and up towards the head, the vein stays in the center of the screen. I don't want it crossing from side to side. Once I've determined where I'm going to go and the angle and direction I need, then I'm going to anchor my probe against either the clavicle or the chin, something nice and solid so you're not going to move during the procedure. Now it's time for the initial puncture. I'm going to be using the needle rather than the cannula and needle, and I've got everything set out to my right that I'm going to need in the immediate few minutes. When you take the guide wire out of the pack, make sure to retract it so that the J-tip is just poking out at the end. This will make it a lot easier when it comes to threading the wire. Now we're ready to go. I've got the bevel of my needle aligned with the numbers, so I know if I'm bevel up or bevel down. I've got my ultrasound anchored against the patient, so it's going to be nice and stable. And I've got the ultrasound in a convenient position for me. Normally it would be on the other side, but you're on that side this time, so I'm not gonna block your view. I'm looking at the screen 
and I've estimated that the top of this vein is two centimeters deep using the scale on the side. And if I put my needle about two centimeters away, it means I'll need three centimeters of needle to get just to the edge of the vessel. So I've punctured through the skin and I'm now pulling back on the syringe while advancing forwards, looking at the ultrasound machine. I can now see that I've got interposition on the ultrasound and I can feel that I've got flashback. Now I'm going to release the pressure on my ultrasound, anchor again with that left hand and make sure that I can still aspirate venous blood. The next step is going to be inserting the guide wire. Again, making sure that I'm anchored, I'm going to release the syringe, cover over the open needle end, and then insert the guide wire. Once I've inserted a short amount, I'm then going to feed back, grasp and push forwards. Feed back, grasp and push forwards to give me an idea whether I'm actually in the vein or if I'm in the subcutaneous tissue. I've got a decent amount of wire inside the vein now, so I can withdraw my needle and get ready for the next step. With my guide wire in place, it's important to check with ultrasound to make sure that you're in the right vessel. Again, looking at the screen, I'm going to scan up and down, and I can see the guide wire inside the vein as far as I'm able to see with my ultrasound. You can also look at this in plane. Centering the vessel on my ultrasound screen, I'm going to rotate the probe through 90 degrees. And then with a small combination of tilt and movement, I can confirm that I can see the wire both entering the vein and not exiting through the back wall. And I can track it along the length that I'm able to see. Now we can move on to dilating. Load your dilator onto the guide wire. and I'm going to be putting some traction upwards on the patient's skin. The key is to hold the dilator down near the tip, not at the hub. You don't want it to bend and kink the guide wire. Push smoothly and rotate if you feel a bit of pressure. This shouldn't be too difficult, but it's often the hardest bit of the procedure, particularly for patients if they're awake. You'll feel a slight give as the dilator enters the vein. After that point, Rotate your dilator to make sure that any tissue that you brought with you is not going to close back up as you take the dilator out. At this point, you can pause. It's worth noting that your central line should be ready to go as this is the next step and after dilation, patients can bleed quite a bit. I've got my gauze ready. I'm going to take my dilator out, making sure I hold the wire steady in space. With the dilator out and firm pressure over the insertion site, I'm now going to slide the central line over the guide wire and insert it. You'll be expecting the guide wire to come out of the distal hub. On these lines, it's the green one. I can see I've left just the right amount of wire. I'm still able to hold onto the wire at the insertion point while seeing it coming out of that distal port at the end. Now I can hold that wire and slide the central line over it. The key point here is to make sure that the wire is not sliding in with the line and that you're keeping an eye on the monitor to make sure that you're not causing any ectopics. With the line inserted, it's now time to take the guide wire out. I think the cleanest way of doing that is to insert it back into the cassette. While you don't have to feed it into the tip of the cassette, it is worthwhile feeding it into this part here. The guide wire should come out quite easily. And you should see the J tip of it to confirm that you've removed all of the wire and make sure you check that with a colleague. Once the guide wire is out, two-person confirmation should be done, as per the lock set. 
With my thumb holding over the end of the central line, I'm now going to aspirate and flush all of the lines. Inserting a syringe, holding it vertically to allow any air bubbles to rise to the top. Once I see a flash of blood in the bottom of the syringe, it's going to be blue in this case, and no more air bubbles, then I'm able to flush that line with saline and insert the clip. Inserting it at the hub is a lot easier than trying to insert it on this flexible line at the bottom. It's simply a case of aspirating and flushing all of your lines, and now let's move on to suturing. In this demonstration, I'm going to be using a 2.0 silk straight needle. You should use what you're most comfortable with, and if you haven't yet learned to suture, it's worth practicing that before you start your central lines, and I suggest using a suture kit with a curved needle for safety. We also have a bio patch. I tend to insert these after the line has been sutured because the small amount of bleeding you can get can end up causing some blood to go on the bio patch. There's various different techniques for suturing. The one I use is to insert one end of the needle back through the hub, across the skin, in one large bite of tissue, carefully picking up the needle on the other side, and then inserting it again through the opposite side of the central line hub. I can then tie a surgical knot to secure the central line in place. Again, if you don't know how to hand tie, you can use instrument tying, ideally with a curved needle. With everything secured in place, it's time to cut off the excess sutures. Our kits have a scalpel blade in to make that easy. But a little tip, you can, in a pinch, use the sharp edge of a needle. cutting away from yourself. I leave about a centimeter of excess suture on top there. Now it's time to insert the bio patch. I'm going to use a cover here from one of the needles just to help ease it underneath, making sure that the blue side is facing away from the patient's skin. To finish up, I'm going to make sure that having aspirated and flushed all my lines, I'm applying sterile caps to everything and that I've cleaned the area thoroughly with some wet and then dry gauze before attaching a tegaderm. Our tegaderms in the packs are quite large, so often it's easier to remove the drape and apply the tegaderm afterwards. Just make sure that you keep the area sterile. Peel off the backing and attach the drape so that the notched out area here sits where your lines are. Pulling the lines through, take off the remaining paper backing including this additional piece. It can be peeled off and secured on top of the back of the dressing. Make sure to date all of your lines. Ours always come with an additional sticker just for this purpose. Before I leave the bed space, it's important to confirm my line using the additional checks. The ultrasound we used is useful, but not confirmatory. I'm going to take a venous gas to confirm what the saturations are, and I'm going to transduce the line to make sure that I see a venous type pulse flow on my monitor. Also remember to reposition the patient into a 30 degree head up or wherever they're most comfortable if they're awake. And then it's time to order a chest x-ray. On that, you're looking for any complications that might have been caused, as well as to confirm the tip of the line is in an appropriate place. That's everything from a practical point of view. Make sure your sharps are put away in the sharps bin and the rest of your equipment is disposed of, including cleaning up the ultrasound. Then it's on to documentation. You can do that on Cerna or whatever system you use. If you want to learn more about any specific aspect of this, then watch our micro skills videos. Woo! Micro skills?